All right, John, ready? Yeah. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is David Simchilevi. I'm on the faculty here at MIT. I'm excited to introduce uh, John Langford uh, to this community. Uh, many of us have known uh, John's work uh, for um, the last few years in the area of machine learning and learning theory. He is especially well known for work uh, in the area of uh, contextual bended, in particular for reinforcement uh, learning. Um, he's uh, author of a well-known blog, hunch.net, and uh, one of the key developers of an open source library for online uh, uh, learning algorithm called VW. He's currently at Microsoft Research, and uh, many of us also know him um, as a person uh, behind uh, ICML. For, for uh, the last couple of years, he served either as a general chair or co-chair of uh, ICML. Welcome, uh, John. Thanks, David. OK, so this is uh, one of my favorite subjects of research right now. Uh, I'd like to keep this as conversational as possible. So free, please feel free to uh, interrupt and ask questions uh, throughout the talk. I'm going to start by with reinforcement learning, which I suspect most people already know. So I'm going to start a little bit briefly. So in reinforcement learning, what happens is you have an observation, which comes from the world. You have an agent, which needs to make a choice using a policy. So it's going to choose some particular action, and then it's going to act up on the world. And then the world is going to respond with some sort of observation. And then the agent will again use a policy to make a choice of an action. And this will continue, and then you'll get a reward eventually. And then the goal in reinforcement learning is to uh, maximize the sum of rewards that you observe over time. Okay, and there's, there's many variations on this kind of setting, but, but this is the kind of setting that we're going to be thinking about. So I think one of the things which is most important to me about the setting is that it's an incredibly natural setting. Um, it's very easy to phrase a lot of problems as, as reinforcement learning settings. In fact, there's kind of a joke that um, there's, every problem can be turned into a reinforcement learning problem, which is much harder than it would need to be. Um, because uh, it is, yeah, so reinforcement learning can capture a, a vast array of different problems, but, uh, but doing it in a way which is tractable is sort of the real trick, okay? And inside the reinforcement learning, there's sort of three different key issues that arise. And the goal is just typically to address these three key issues. They're credit assignment, generalization, and exploration, right? And I wanna go through each of these individually a little bit, just to make them a little bit crisper in terms of what I mean by each of these, because I mean something different and crisp for each of these. And when I say the, the reinforcement learning trifecta in the title, what I mean is how can we do reinforcement learning that can capture all three of these simultaneously? All right, so uh, let's start first with uh, credit assignment. So what do people mean when they say credit assignment? Um, <clears throat> suppose you uh, are trying to get to the top of, of Bear Mountain and uh, you go the wrong direction. So the question then is which turn went wrong? So knowing uh, where you went wrong or where you went right and making your decisions is a credit assignment problem because you made a sequence of decisions as you were hiking across different paths, you went left, you went right. Uh, and eventually ugh, um, eventually you, uh, you, 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 got, you got somewhere and you either got where you wanted to go or somewhere else and now knowing where you went wrong is, is kind of the key credit assignment issue. This issue is, is, is separate from the other two issues and it's essential to solve in reinforcement. Okay, so then there's also dynamic, okay, so an example solution here is dynamic programming. If, you, if you, all you're concerned about is credit assignment, then uh, you can use dynamic programming to figure out the shortest path between a goal and some start state. 
by just um, keeping track of the frontier, always expanding sort of the, uh, the point closest to the goal and eventually reaching the start state. And then you, you will be able to discover exactly what the shortest path is like that. You'll also be able to do credit assignment because you'll know that when you step off the shortest path, you'll, you'll know, uh, you can look at the dynamic programming state and you can say, oh, I've incurred this much cost associated with my choice. Okay, so that's, that's credit assignment. There's also a challenge of exploration. This is different from credit assignment. It, it's, it's, a, it's an orthogonal issue. Uh, and, and I would say exploration is how do you gather the data that you need in order to learn effectively? Okay, and uh, there's, this is a problem which is, you can solve credit assignment and not exploration or exploration and not credit assignment. Uh, if you don't solve both of them, you're not going to be able to solve reinforcement learning very well in general. So a good example of exploration is the simple epsilon greedy algorithm, which people use in contextual bandits at times. Um, and the idea there is that, you know, with some probability you're going to exploit, you're going to try to uh, discover the, um, the best choice and to act according to that. And then with some probability you'll explore, you'll just kind of try other alternatives at random. And then, uh, that will give you the information that you need in order to continue to learn how to best exploit. Okay, so this is an example of, of exploration. Um, you can do better, but this is the simplest one to describe. And then the, the, the last challenge here is generalization. So in generalization, um, question is how do you learn to act based on things you've never before seen, right? So you may have never seen this uh, uh, forest scene, but um, you still know how to go down the path, right? And you even know what the path is. That, that's a, it's a, it's generalization. And that ability to act based upon things you've never seen before uh, through some notion of similarity or some, something that you've learned about the environment in the past is generalization. We're very familiar with generalization in general from supervised learning. So uh, maybe in supervised learning, maybe what happens is you have handwritten digits and you have labels and you shove them into a box and you get out a digit classifier. The thing that the digit classifier is doing is generalization. It's, it's, it's somehow uh, discovering how to classify handwritten things that is never seen before based upon previous examples. Okay, so the, the, these are kind of the three core building blocks that I think of when I, I think about trying to solve reinforcement learning. And now um, you can go beyond this and you can think about combinations of these building blocks, right? So if you wanna look at two of them, uh, maybe exploration and generalization, that is contextual bandits. So we can, we can think of a, of a form of reinforcement learning which doesn't care about the future, it's just like, you see some observations, you choose an action, you see a reward, and now you try to optimize things, right? Um, the goal here is typically to minimize the regret, which is defined as uh, how well you do in terms of your realized reward compared to the realized reward of the best policy in a set of policies, right? Um, you wanna make that, get as close as possible to the best policy, even though you don't know it in advance. Right. And um, nowadays, there's a service, this personalized service, where you can go and get your own contextual bandit, and you can use it to optimize things on your web page. Um, this is widely used inside of Microsoft and outside as well now, and it's, it's doing lots of good things. So this is a ex great example of a limited form of reinforcement learning actually being widely used. Okay, so this is exploration and generalization, and then you can also Think about credit assignment and exploration. So credit assignment plus exploration is essentially MDP learning. Uh, so the idea here is that you have a tabular markup decision process. So you have some actions, you have, here, this is an example where you have uh, 
let's see, uh, one, two actions coming out of three different states. These actions have some sort of random transitions. So 0.1 plus 0.7 plus 0.2 adds up to one. Uh, and sometimes you get rewards. And then your goal is going to be to, um, to, to achieve, use exploration to discover what a good policy would be, right? And a, a typical algorithm would be something where you observe state action. Next state triples, you build some sort of approximate model of the world, and then you, you plan to act in that imperfect model according to various objectives, trying to reach things you don't know, uh, and eventually you uh, get enough information to learn a good policy. Okay, and then um, the last pair that you can look at is credit assignment and generalization. So this is, this is kind of the realm of policy improvement algorithms. So the idea there is that you have some interaction between the world and an agent, which observes some reward. And now you wanna think about deviations uh, from this uh, policy and about the reward that they uh, uh, cause, right? Or uh, did you observe when you take those deviations? And now the, the way the algorithm typically work here is you, you have some observation process, you have some policy pi, and now your goal is to find a better policy, pi prime. So um, you use small deviations, look at the outcomes, you use that to update to a new policy pi prime, and things get better and better over time. So this is this is policy gradient, the reinforce algorithm. This is also um, many more advanced forms which people come up with uh, more recently. Um, a long time ago, Sham and I worked on uh, approximately optimal approximate uh, reinforcement learning. That was the title of the paper, and it was about conservative policy iteration, which also has this kind of flavor. Okay, so this is, these are all the pairs, and what you get when you put all this together is, is, is a picture where you start with your three atoms and you start adding the pairs to these atoms. Uh, and, and now you can see that there's uh, many different pieces of reinforcement learning that we're familiar with. Some people are more familiar with one piece than another. And you can see that there's this, this centerpiece, this which is um, all three. John, um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so typically we think of the exploration exploitation dilemma. I'm wondering yeah. how how do you uh, reconcile that with your picture? Yeah, so exploration, I guess, is not the only goal. You want to do well in the world uh, for whatever that means. Typically, you need to do exploration in order to gather the information necessary in order to do well. So there's a there is a trade-off there. Um, I guess I, I think of the explore exploit trade-off as being something which is a part of the exploration problem because unless you can actually do exploration, it's sort of um, you don't have something to trade off. Got it. So you would say exploitation is not in this picture, or I think that. So when you look in, in contextual bandits, we've studied exploration algorithms in uh, great detail. And I think when you look at the, at the good exploration algorithms, what you see is that there isn't like a, there isn't a knob like an epsilon gradient. It's just, you know, you're, you're acting and you have some strategy to how you act. That strategy to how you act does both exploration and exploitation. There's not a, there's no, there's no, it just, it just, it just is acting in order to minimize regret. So I, I can't separate exploration and exploitation when I look at advanced exploration algorithms. Got it. Thank you. Are there other questions about this? Uh -huh. Question I have here is, uh, what would happen if we relax the assumption that uh, you don't have that IID? Yeah, that's actually fascinating. Contextual bandit. Yeah, so uh, let's go back. Um, 
All right, so this ACFS 95 the IID paper. sequence. I meant yeah, the so, IID sequence. Yeah, yeah, so we have IID here. And IID mm -hmm. is, is what I've normally worked with. Um, if you go back to the ACFS 95 paper, they do not require IID, that they, they work against adversarial sequences, which is amazing. Um, I've tried to talk to people who do, do clinical trials about this, and it's like it's like beyond the gold standard of a clinical trial because there's no assumption of independence at all. Um, so why do we assume independence? And essentially, it's for computational reasons. When we when we when the world is IID, it's um, easy to think about having a Oracle learning algorithm, oops, which um, which you can use over and over again, uh, an Oracle supervised learning algorithm, which you can use over and over again to solve contextual bandits. And that allows you to reuse a vast arsenal of supervised learning algorithms. So that that's the primary reason why I think the analysis of contextual balance is often in the IID setting. In practice, in the real world, Things are not actually always IID. They're not quite as adversarial as, as but the, but dealing with non-stationarity is actually a, a topic of research. Uh, I'm involved in some projects along those lines right now. Does that, uh, does that help? Good. Yeah. Are there other questions? Okay, so let me first tell you that the, okay, so this is a, this is a general problem. It's not just a problem that people in theory pay attention to. People in, in practice are trying to solve this as well, and there have been uh, a number of attempts. And uh, I, I kind of want to tell you a few ways that, that sort of don't work very well because they're not they're not, uh, they're not structurally sound. Um, so uh, a, a common approach that you might see is something where uh, you bottleneck, uh, you, you use an autoencoder. So you have, you, you have your, your camera, your camera sends you an image, you, you, you learn a function which maps that image down to a small number of bits, and then you learn a function which maps that small number of bits back to the camera image. And you, you're learning these simultaneously together, and you're trying to do as well as you can, right? Um, Okay, so this, this is a way of sort of compressing the observation space, and the hope is that the compressed representation uh, is a is a good um, state space, right? Um, it turns out this doesn't work very well. It's sort of a, a simple example you can give. Uh, suppose that you have a bunch of bits; most of them are pure noise. Uh, one of them is a state bit, um, and if you're optimizing log loss, you're going to store the, the one bit in the bottleneck, which changes your log loss the most, which means the bit with the highest entropy, which means essentially a noise bit. Uh, so that, that sounds it's kind of artificial, but you can easily imagine how structural noise of one sort or another could lead to uh, this kind of thing happening. Okay, so that's, that's the autoencoder approach. There's another uh, really cool approach based upon this uh, inverse kinematics. Um, so the idea there is that you you have your your next observation and your previous observation, and from that you try to predict the action. Um, it turns out that you can actually break this with this little example here. Um, so. If so suppose you're randomly in either S1 or S2 to begin with, and um, and then you take action A1, then you end up in either S3 or S4. And so you can predict the action A1 perfectly, right? So give, given either S1 or S2 and either S3 or S4, you can predict A1. And then given S1 and S2 and either S5 or S6, you can predict the action A2 perfectly. Right. 
Now let's keep going. Given S3 or S4 and S7 or S8, you can predict the action A1 was taken perfectly. Uh, it's over here. And then given S5 or S6, you can predict the action uh, and uh, S7 or S8, you can predict the action A2 perfectly. All right, so as far as inverse kinematics is concerned, S1, S2 is a single state, S3, S4 is a single state, S5, S6 is a single state, and S7, S8 is a single state. Okay, so that, 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 that's, that's interesting. Um, what that would mean if this was, these are truly uh, the same, if, if S7 was the same as S8, that would mean that you couldn't distinguish between them. But uh, there is a policy which uh, can always reach S7, right? And so if we're 50-50 in S1, S2, so if we wanna reach S7 and we start out in S1, then we go A1, A1. And if, we're, if we start out in S2 and we wanna reach S7, we do go A2, A2. So that ability to reach at a pure S7 means that S7 is sort of distinct from S8 in some sort of semantic sense. Um, but the inverse kinematics approach can't um, can't distinguish that effectively. So that's that's kind of frustrating. And then the last approach, which I think people talk about, is is by simulation. And the idea here is that you sort of you have like a you have an MDP with an enormous number of states and actions and rewards, and then you start kind of saying, ah, I can alias these two states. And everything will, will remain the same dynamics-wise, um, and you just do that over and over and over again in order to uh, collapse the size of the state space. Um, uh, so this is kind of statistically intractable. So if, if you have a large number of uh, states that you want to try to alias together, um, it's going to take a enormous number of samples to do that uh, with high quality. So this is, this is, I think, a really critical slide. Are there any questions here? So if you do autoencoder, it's weak to structural noise. If you do inverse kinematics, it's weak to uh, things which should be separate, but you don't know that until you do multiple time steps. And if you do by simulation like approaches, it can be weak to, um, I mean, it, it, it's weak in the same sense that sort of estimating a distribution is difficult because in order to estimate a distribution, you have to get a lot of samples from that distribution. Uh, and the same kind of high sample complexity requirements uh, can apply to by simulation approaches. <clears throat> Okay, so um, for the last several years, we've been trying to figure out how to actually achieve this trifecta. And initially, a lot of our results were about, um, ugh, it seems to be some sort of auto advance. Um, <clears throat> initially, many of our results were essentially information theoretic. So it was just saying that the information is necessary in order to, is there in order to learn efficiently. Uh, so that's things like the, the low Bellman rank and the low witness rank uh, papers. Um, there's actually some new results, which I haven't incorporated into this. Um, I've been learning about them over the last couple of months. Uh, this is, okay, so I guess what I'm trying to say is there's, there's kind of an explosion of results in this area. There was essentially nothing until uh, what, four or five years ago. And now there's many papers coming out uh, which are trying to generalize things, you're trying to figure out how to make find companies tra computationally trackable subsets or or other things like that. Um, there's also on the empirical side, there's a lot of people who are very interested in this uh, this problem as well. And so you see uh, a lot of more empirical papers trying to figure out, trying to grasp how to uh, achieve all three of these things together, the the exploration, 
in the credit assignment and the generalization. Okay, so going through all of this is um, more than we have time for. So I'm going to go through one of these, which is, I think, particularly explainable. Um, and then mention a little bit about some of the other approaches and then tell you where I think the problems are that uh, we would really like to solve. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about the, the, the block MDP uh, learning problem. Um, <clears throat> so we're thinking about a situation where you have a horizon, uh, it's, it's, it's big H, and you're going to repeatedly, Sorry, yeah. Uh, could you say what the colors mean on the previous slide? Oh, um, Or it's okay. Uh, I'm actually not quite certain what the colors mean. I think they have to do with the computational tractability. Uh, this was so this is a tutorial that we did at Fox. Uh, and I'm going to give a reference to that at the end, where people can look at things for much more detail than uh, I can go into right now. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> John, another question. Yeah. On this, uh, where are we in terms of um, characterizing uh, the optimal regret? You're talking here about tractability. Yeah, I think often our notion of optimal regret is not well defined. Uh, the, the results that we often see here are like, you know, h to the 10, one over epsilon to the 15th type things, right? So that they, they um, they're nowhere near uh, optimal uh, regret. I so, so achieving some sort of polynomial dependence upon uh, the log of the number of policies and the time horizon and the number of actions alone is often very challenging. There have been some initial works around regret, but um, I think there's a huge amount to do here. Good. Yeah. Okay, so block MDB problem. We're thinking about a hard horizon. So we just, it's one, two, big H. We see an observation. We can think of this as a, like a giant vector if we want. Maybe it's a megapixel camera. We take an action, you see a reward. Uh, it may be that you never see the reward until the end, right? So the reward could just always be zero until the end. But the point is that we, we do have an episode. And so you want to optimize a sequence of actions dependent upon a high dimensional observation where you never see the same observation twice. Uh, so how do you, how do you succeed? Okay, so we're going to think about a situation which is very close to market position process. It, it, it has states, you have actions, you have initial states, you have transition matrix, you have a reward process, you have a horizon, and then you have this one extra thing, which is you have an observation distribution. So you're never going to be told S. You're only going to be told X. You only ever see the, the, the megapixel camera. You never see the, the latent state. And okay, so in general, this would be uh, totally intractable because it'd be a palm DP. But we're going to make this extra easy. We're going to say, look, uh, the x's are disjoint over x. So that means that every x implicitly is associated with some s. Uh, so there is, there exists some way to decode from the observation to the latent state. Now you're not told that in advance, but but that exists as existentially. So this is not as hard as a PomDP. It is, if you try to solve this as a market position process, you're going to die because the number of possible X's here is enormously large, even if the number of latent states might be very tractable to solve. So now we would like to actually succeed with a, a complexity which is dependent upon the number of latent states rather than uh, something related to the number of possible observations. And then uh, the other thing that we're going to assume is that we have access to um, some learning algorithms, which will um, 
maximize or minimize maximize rewards or minimize costs uh, if we know the costs for every given choice. Okay, so there's, I think often there's a, there's a difficulty associated with optimizing on some representation. Uh, and yet in practice, it ends up being pretty tractable to just do gradient descent. And so we're, we're sort of taking the, the difficulty of achieving the global optimum uh, and we're saying, look, choose a good representation choose a good optimization algorithm. That, that, that's just kind of the Oracle's responsibility. It's not going to be our responsibility in thinking about how to solve uh, a block and view problem. So uh, again, this is working in the, in, the, in the policy space. In a policy, uh, um, executing the Oracle. Uh, this is what you're referring to. This is, I assume, NP hard problem. It could easily be NP hard. Um, so solving this argmin problem could be NP hard. So we, we have some features. We have a, a vector of costs, one for each action. The goal of the Oracle is to find the policy which minimizes the sum of costs in our data set. Hmm. Right? And that, so that, that can easily be NP hard. Um, in practice, people do amazing things with deep learning all the time. Um, so we're, we're saying like, um, I'm going to rely upon my deep learning friends to, uh, solve this optimization effectively. Um, could you comment on the distinction between blog MDP and by simulation? Uh, yeah. That's interesting. So um, one way to look at this <clears throat> would be to say that you have an MDP in the X's, right? And you can create a by simulation between the S and the X. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, but here it's a good idea to do. And in some cases it's not a good idea to do. Well, when you're trying to do by simulation, you need to have a description of essentially the T and the Q uh, in order to digest it down from the X to the S. I see, I see. So it's a matter of what's given. Yes. So we're not given the Q and we're not given the T all we're given is the X's, basically. Okay. And, yeah. Oh, hi. Yeah. Um, I you mentioned that this is like a, similar to a by simulation. Does that mean that for every X in S one, and given an action, has equal probability of trans um, of uh, transitioning to a X in S two? Like, are yes. those probabilities equal? Okay. Yes. That, that is critical. That's right. Yeah, so, so it's a really good observation. Okay, so this is the block MDB problem. And we have an algorithm for, for solving this, right? And uh, the way the algorithm works is it's kind of three phases associated with it, three, three modes it operates in. One of them is exploration. So we're going to assume inductively that we know how to reach all of the latent states at uh, time step little h, or little h minus one here. Um, and then we're going to we're going to use a homing policy, which is where the name comes from, to reach those latent states. And then we'll act randomly, and then we'll observe some next observation. So this is, this is how we explore. We can gather information in this way. And then we're going to create an abstraction. Right. So uh, the way that we do this is we say, look, we have the x the A and the X prime that we observed here. And with probably 50%, we're going to replace with some, the X prime with some other X prime. And now we have examples that have been corrupted and then uncorrupted examples, each of them labeled with a one and a zero. And we're going to learn to predict 
whether or not an example has been corrupted. And so I'm, I'm specifying, so this phi here is something with a lot of parameters. Uh, I'm, I'm, the, the phi is going to be something which takes the, the, the megapixel camera image's input uh, and it outputs one of a discrete set of possibilities. And then the P here is also something with parameters, but it's, it's essentially only a lookup table. It's, it's, it's mapping a discrete value, which 5x outputs the action in the discrete value, which 5x prime outputs to some value, right? And you try to minimize squared loss. You, you optimize all these parameters simultaneously to minimize your uh, squared loss. Okay, so that, this is the abstraction step. And then, the homing step is the last part. We're going, we need to satisfy the inductive guarantee. So for every value of phi on X prime, we're gonna say, oh, this is a state. Um, and then we're gonna learn a policy which maximizes the probability that phi of X prime equals X. And that allows us to uh, operate inductively. And at the end, you have a set of policies which allow you to reach all of the latent states. So you can return the homing policies. And, and basically, once you have this, it's easy to optimize for any reward function that you might happen to care about. So are there questions about this algorithm? Uh, yeah. yeah. What happens when a state, uh, when observation is not mapped to a state, but it's in between two states? sort of represents a transition. Yeah, so this phi here is in the construct of the algorithm, it, 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 is, it, it's, it discretizes. So it's gonna make some decision. Okay. And it, it may be wrong sometimes, but what you can prove is that if there's a discrete set of latent states, the ways in which it's wrong don't accumulate too badly and things work anyways. Thank you. Any other questions? I should really like put a hat, I think, on these S's because this, these are not the states in the block MDP. They're the, the, the latent states that you infer based upon your learning process. Okay, so this is this is kind of a cool algorithm. Um, you can prove some things about it. Uh, we we actually implemented the algorithm. We applied it to a problem where you have a one in ten to the one hundred chance of achieving a reward. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, it did indeed work, and it worked better than any other exploration items we could find. There's a bunch of heuristics like the random network distillation, which are a lot of fun. Uh, but but this they, they break down when you get to these complex problems. So what you can prove about the Homer algorithm is that uh, you know it's, it's sample complexity requirements to achieve an epsilon optimal policy are kind of polynomial and everything you might care about. Um, so that's that's fantastic. Um, and if, if I'm if I'm thinking about this at a high level, I'm saying look. When you, if you have rich observations and you can do deep learning in order to achieve the oracle, you can create a covering set of policies and giving, given the covering set of policies, you can efficiently learn to optimize any reward function that you care about. <clears throat> okay, so, so why does it work? Um, so this is related to the observation that people made a little bit earlier. Um, if x prime one and x prime two, so two, two next observations are inseparable, that means that the ratios of their probabilities are the same uh, for all policies, right? Uh, and then you have this notion of backward kinematic inseparability, which is important. It says that however you happen to realize your next state observations, the, the ratios of the probabilities of, of these observations uh, are equal, All right? So you have some distribution U over the X and A. Uh, and uh, if you just, if you multiply these things out, you get inequality.
So that, that that's that's key to the proof. Um, now that uh, that notion of kinematic inseparability is sort of the defining notion of what a state is inside of Homer. Okay, <clears throat> but but what is a state, right? And now let me tell you some of the things that are a little problematic. Um, let's let's back up a little bit. So when people say state, they mean a lot of different things. So naively, uh, it might be just your observation space. Um, traditional reinforcement learning definition would be kind of like a sufficient statistic. It's sort of the sufficient information to base an action on. Um, you might say, oh, look, you want to achieve minimal sufficient information to base an action on. This would be kind of like the, the physics notion. So you would you have a position orientation and velocity of every object or something like that. Um, Kinematic inseparability is a different definition of state. Uh, it is sufficient, but it is not minimally sufficient. It's not minimal and sufficient. And that's kind of painful. Um, that's one of the problems which I guess I'm interested in trying to address. Um, so you have to think about what minimal means. Um, yeah, right. So, how, how do you achieve it? And unfortunately, I don't have an answer. I was hoping uh, this is one of the problems that I'm like itching to solve. Um, I, I don't know how to define what is a minimal sufficient state in a way which can be derived from prediction problems. But what I can tell you is that there are other approaches to latent state decoding, uh, which address other weaknesses of various forms of latency decoding, and which seem, which, which gives a little bit of a broader understanding of what it means than just a single algorithm for discrete states, right? So all of these have a structure where you kind of explore whatever is easily explored. Uh, you abstract to create a latent state space. So you, you, you have some prediction problem that you solve, which creates that latent state space, and then you, you cover you figure out how to kind of cover the set of new possibilities you've discovered so as to reach a new set of hard to reach things. And you just kind of do that over and over again. So this is, this is a loop and that loop allows you to avoid a catch 22, which is that in order to explore effectively, you need to understand the latent state space. And in order to understand the latent state space, you need to explore effectively. So operating in this loop allows you to kind of expand out from what you know to what you don't know and make that be known. Okay, so some other examples of this are this uh, flambe algorithm. And the idea there is that um, we're thinking about a structure where the transition operator on observations is defined by a low rank matrix. <clears throat> okay, and if you have a discrete set of states, you can always say that there's a low rank matrix. So this is more general than just the Homer setting. Um, and so, so what exploration is going to look like is you're going to kind of um, uh, cover a basis in the representation uh, of, uh, of this low rank matrix. Right, so you, we're going to have a set of policies, which uh, so we have the same kind of loop where we're, we're going from H equals little one to big H. But now instead of having sort of discrete latent states, we're going to have vectors. And we're going to want these vectors to span the, the, the latent space of the transition matrix. And in the, in the way that you learn is going to be through essentially maximizing uh, the log loss of your estimated transition matrix. And uh, the way that you're going to uh, uh, discover how to home is by maximizing the range of the 5xA. Okay. So that's, um, that's a, a slightly more general approach, which is a little bit less tractable in terms of the uh, polynomial. Um, and now uh, you can prove that this is um, 
this is also trackable in terms of as yes, a polynomials have complexity. And the fact that I'm not listing the constants on that polynomial definitely means that we do not know what the right regret is. I think we're very far off. And there's quite a bit to do to improve on that. Okay, now let, let me tell you one last thing, which is this is a paper we had at, at NeurIPS. Um, there's this notion of a linear quadratic regulator. Um, uh, you suppose that the way that the state evolves is according to some sort of linear dynamics like this equation up here. But now we suppose that we don't actually see the state, we just see the observation according to this Q function. So that Q function could be essentially arbitrary, um, but we still want it to be the case that the, that the observed X is rich enough to identify the latent state S. Okay, and now um, you can actually recover the latent state space in general. Um, so the way it starts is you kind of just explore randomly initially. Um, and then you start doing um, an inverse kinematics like operation uh, where you're trying to predict the action. And you do a bunch of um, operations to identify an approximate A hat and approximate B hat. But then you may be very far from where you actually want to optimize for. And so you, you're, going to, you're going to keep on optimizing until uh, you can prove, uh, optimizing your definition of A hat and B hat until you can actually prove that, the, that you have a good representation in the vicinity of the optimum that you're trying to uh, achieve a, a good reward for. Okay, so this is a, actually kind of a long paper. Um, and there's a lot of details, but, but the, the idea is that you explore randomly initially, you start building up your representations, and then you just keep on improving it over and over as you home in on uh, what is an optimal controller. Right? And you can, you can prove a theorem associated with this, where you're dependent upon the dimensions of the latent state space and the dimensions of the action space, and not dependent upon the dimension of the observation space. Okay, so, so where are we? Um, latent states can be discovered via certain prediction problems. That seems like that's a, that's a really cool thing that I did not know a few years ago. Um, that seems powerful uh, and it may really change the way things work in the future. Um, there are several different kinds of latent state. It's not clear to me that we should have many kinds of latent state. It may be that there's some, some way to uh, combine these or find the master prediction problem for deriving latent state or something like that. I, I, I don't know. Um, that's something that we would really like to figure out. Uh, so, so a key question is how do we make it more universal? Is there some sort of ontology of latent states or uh, I, I'm not certain. And then how do we make it more tractable? Um, we have algorithms now that we can actually run uh, but they're not like super fast algorithms. Um, figuring out how to map things onto GPUs and whatnot is, is certainly work that needs to be done. And furthermore, I think there's this work of the form, uh, there's certain operations in our prediction problems, which could be, may potentially be made exponentially faster. Uh, so that, that could be exciting and that could be really change the scale of problem that we could address in terms of discovering the late state space effectively. Right, and then the, the, the tutorial that we did at Fox is here. So if you want to um, dive into more detail, it's recorded. Uh, this is uh, something that Akshay and Alec and I did at Fox. So um, definitely feel free. All right, so are there other questions? Yeah, so when uh, can you please go to the previous slide? So here? Yes. Uh, so here uh, we are assuming that X uh, is rich enough. 
but in traditional uh, uh, system identification literature the emphasis is on a which is uh, input and that input is sufficiently rich so do you think these uh, two as uh, two assumptions agree with each other uh, i don't know what assumption agreement means here what i'm thinking about is uh, let's think of this as like a uh, third party card pool right mm -hmm. so you instead of getting the uh, location of the cart and the angle of the pole, you get a th an, an image of cart pole. So that's what X is, right? So it's giving you all the information about the latent state, but it's giving you in a way which is kind of intuitively understandable by a human, but, but, but the computer doesn't understand it all in the beginning. And now given this information, we want to uh, actually um, discover the latent state space and discover these a, a and B matrices and so forth. I was talking about the small A, which is next to B. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's the input space. Yeah. So the, if I can uh, ex, uh, expand on the idea, what happens sure. is if we have a uh, rich enough A, that means it has pushed the system to all its possible modes, which makes it easy to capture the dynamics from X. Yeah, so there are some constraints here. If you, if you can't, if, if A can't actually exercise S, then um, you're, you're not going to succeed. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the A doesn't have to exercise, it doesn't have to give you direct access to all values of S, right? So and the thing to think about here is in physics, you have this notion of position and momentum, right? And so you can't necessarily achieve any position of momentum from a single action. You may need a sequence of actions to achieve a particular momentum. Um, could you please go back to the slide where you talked about the minimal statistics uh, for state representation? Yeah, let's go back here. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering, like, uh, in our like, uh, there's this thing like predictive state representation. Does that work mm -hmm. in this case? Yeah. So predictive state representations are definitely related. That they're solving prediction problems. Uh, I think that the I don't know good results there, which are getting at the latent state in a manner which is robust to noise. So there's, there's, a, there's a transition in complexity between a situation where the world is deterministic and where the world is stochastic. Uh, when the world is deterministic, the, the, there's no real distinction between a policy and a sequence of actions, right? And so you, you can do sort of this open loop uh, control of a system and that works fine. But when the world is stochastic, you have to be able to do closed loop things to succeed. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know PSR results, which can handle that stochastic structure. Uh, so as to achieve closed loop control. Do you? I don't know. Yeah. Any other questions? So one uh, question on the model itself. When H is equal, capital H is equal to one, my understanding from the description, this becomes uh, contextual bending. Yeah, that's right. Does the algorithm reduce uh, Homer? Does the algorithm reduce to uh, a well-known algorithm in this case? Yeah, it's what I call the tau first algorithm. It's just you explore a bunch of times at the beginning, and then I see, I see. Uh, you know you're done. <laughs> I see. <laughs> it's a fine algorithm if you happen to know that things are stationary. Um, and you want to be simple, but uh, 
it's, it is simplistic. Yep. I wonder if you could comment on the importance of the contrastive approach on the previous slide. Uh, this one here? Uh, yes. Yeah. So this is certainly a, a key bit of the algorithm in the sense of exactly this prediction problem is what is necessary in order to, which is, is certainly sufficient to prove the results. Um, uh, I regard this as basically a good first attempt at creating a prediction problem for discovering latent states. I don't regard it as the final answer. I, I think that there are better answers out there. Um, I would love to just figure out what those are. All right. I think, John, you told us that you need to finish on the hour. Yeah. So maybe one last question, if anybody has one. Sure. And if not, this was great. Uh, thank uh, you so much for spending time with us. Yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot for inviting me. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.